So welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. Today, I'm honored to be able to host co-founder of March for Our Lives, David Hogg. And today we're going to be jumping into a conversation, really talking about activism, self-care, and ending gun violence. Now, I know for those of you in the audience, a lot of you are probably familiar with David. You're familiar with his work and his efforts. And I think today it'll be nice to really peel back a little bit and talk about um, some of the things that he's been involved in, some of his goals, but also about him as a person and some of the things that he's really trying to elevate um, in terms of really making sure that the work that others are doing on the ground in a lot of ways is also highlighted as well. So really excited to jump into this conversation. Obviously, David is someone who was thrust into activism following the tragic and unfortunate shooting at his high school in Parkland, Florida in 2018. And from that event, he and his classmates have really vowed to be game changers and uh, change makers in a lot of ways. And he's resolved that no other person, no other young person should have to experience the tragic impact of violence of gun violence in particular. So as I mentioned, he's the co-founder of March for Our Lives. They've been involved in lots of different initiatives over the years. Uh, just to highlight a few, the march they had in Washington, DC, where he spoke to an estimated 800,000 protesters. He and his sister, Lauren, are also authors. Uh, they co-authored Never Again, which became a New York Times bestselling book. They also contributed to the book, Glimmer of Hope, How Tragedy Sparked a Movement. And they've been involved in lots of different uh, efforts over the years, touring across the country, really meeting families and individuals who've had losses at the hands of gun violence, and just also educating themselves about ways to really make an impact. Um, David's also someone who has a pretty large uh, social media following, and he really uses his platform to promote civic engagement, activism, and voting. So again, just grateful to have David here on the Addy Hour episode today. David, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Of course. So again, you know, a lot of people know about you, maybe not know a lot about you in terms of per on the personal level. Uh, but one of the things that I really like to do on this program too, is always just to check in with folks. Um, I think it's important to remind people that you're also a student. So, you know, in the middle of all this work that you're doing, you've also been taking classes, you're coming to the end of the semester. So I actually just wanted to start out and see how things are with you these days in the midst of everything that's going on in the world, you know, as you're wrapping up the semester, um, just in your daily life, how, how are you doing these days? Yeah, I would say I'm pretty good. Um, just trying to figure out. Um, I don't know. It's kind of, it's kind of weird because when you take time off of school or work, I think a lot of people have this feeling where it's like you don't have things to be stressed out about mm. anymore, but you still have the stress for some reason, you know. Mm. So I, I've been dealing with that, um, and I've just been thinking a lot more about what I want to do in the future. Um, uh, just because I'm, I'm now halfway through, through my, my, uh, you know, four years of college mm -hmm. and, uh, thinking about different, um, different opportunities and stuff, internships and things to do, even though I, I really, honestly, I wish I could just, you know, uh, take time off and like not do anything for a minute because it's, uh, I think our, my generation, especially, but mm -hmm. pretty much Americans in general have a, uh, an arguably unhealthy obsession with, like doing as much as possible and don't mm -hmm. really value spending time with friends and family as much mm -hmm. as I think we should. Mm -hmm. Um, cause we think in a very almost like hyper capitalistic manner, mm -hmm. um, that can, uh, you know, really kind of hurt a lot of our friendships, relationships, and, you know, uh, our family relationships overall. Um, although I think a lot of us have been able to spend more time this year with our, with our families and everything for some of us, perhaps too much. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good overall, just, mm -hmm. uh, trying to be more accepting of not necessarily knowing what I'm going to do in the future, mm -hmm. even though I know, I, I know it'd be something vaguely political or mm -hmm. communications or whatever. Um, you know, being, being accept, more accepting of the unknown and kind of embracing it and taking care of myself while I'm doing that. Right. Right. Well, I appreciate your honesty in that. And I think that's, a, that's really healthy in a lot of ways too. Uh, but I think it's good that you, you know, you're being honest with yourself and also highlighting the tension between all yeah. the work that needs to be done, but then also knowing that, you know, it's still good to slow down, spend time with family and friends, but there's not always right. an easy answer. So I think, you know, just even the fact that you're verbalizing it, because I think for a lot of us, sometimes it's easy, like you said, not to verbalize it and just go kind of a thousand miles an hour and not even right. take that time to pull back. So, I mean, on yeah. that note too, you all have been, I mean, I mean, I think part of it's just because you all have been so, it isn't baked in the culture, like you said, but all the important work you all have been doing over the last three years, so I just, you know, just to kind of pull back a little bit, what's that been like, would you say, for the last three years being David Hogg? I know that sounds like a uh, 
like a cheesy question, but I really just wanted to kind of get right. a, a sense or a capturing of what that journey has been like for you. Um, I mean, it's certainly had its ups and its downs. Uh, I would say that it's been really amazing to see how my friends and, and I are able to take an idea, like doing a march on Washington or talking about youth voting and really turn it, help turn it into reality. Although mm -hmm. we were by no means the only people that talked about youth voting, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been incredible to see the achievements we've had over the, even the past three years with one of the highest youth voter turnouts in 2018, yeah. many, you know, non-presidential midterm, mm -hmm. um, and really the highest youth voter turnout in American history in 2020. Uh, it, it's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also, so I think those are some of the, the high, high, high points. I think some of the lower ones though are as I kind of talked about earlier, that not unhealthy obsession, like hyper capitalistic obsession with productivity and like that's that being the only thing that matters. Um paired with the trauma and survivor's guilt of mm -hmm. you know going through shooting mm -hmm. um and, and and talking to all these people that have have experienced gun violence on a daily basis, literally probably tens of thousands of people at this point. Um the pairing of those two things is a really dangerous combination that I've mm -hmm. seen um hurt a lot of people that I know that have worked in um the, I would, what I would call the peace advocacy space mm -hmm. um, because the work that we do is very important, but sometimes because it is so important, we lose sight of how important we are mm -hmm. and the importance of taking care of ourselves in this because of that guilt, because of that PTSD and that trauma, the trauma driven response. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've certainly had my own, um, you know, challenges with that. Not, you know, not just because of like notoriety or attention or whatever, much of which, you know, quite frankly, is because Parkland is a disproportionate, a, you know, a predominantly white community that's mm -hmm. more affluent than the average community. Um, but it's also because uh, I share a lot of that, <clears throat> a lot of that unhealthy obsession with productivity. And I, for a long, the longest time, I just, I really looked at the work that we were doing like a campaign. Mm. You know, I thought in 2018, we're just going to work. 36 hours a day, basically, you know, every single day mm -hmm. and not stop for anything. Mm -hmm. um, and literally work oftentimes until we got physically, you know, sick to the point that we couldn't work anymore, which happened mm -hmm. multiple times to me. And I, I know happened to others that we worked with. Um, but it's really taken me broadening that view and realizing that mm -hmm. my self care and hanging out with friends and talking to people isn't something to feel guilty about. Mm -hmm. Um, it's something that's a necessity. It's part of my productivity. Mm -hmm. Um, cause this isn't, it's not like a campaign where it's a, you know, a sprint, you know, you have November 3rd or whatever date it is right. that you're going to finish by. Um, we don't know when gun violence is going to end. It's more, mm -hmm. it's much more ac accustomed to, you know, an ultra marathon where we don't know the ultimate destination. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of wrong paths we can go down. So mm -hmm. we really have to pace ourselves and be even prepared to pass on the baton to the next generation. Although I hope that's not necessary. Right. Um, so it, it's been a lot over the past three years. It's felt like a, a lifetime. Um, so much travel, so many, you know, people that I've met, so many experiences. Um, and I really had to challenge myself to figure out how to prioritize myself mm -hmm. and putting kind of putting on my oxygen mask first mm -hmm. before yeah. I can help anyone else. And it's yeah. it's difficult when we have this obsession with constant achievement and constantly doing more and more and more and more. And, the, you know, being obsessed with productivity instead of um, realizing the importance of, and it sounds super cliche. And I, I, I mean, I kind of hate the term, but like taking care of yourself, mm -hmm. you know, cause we hear it all the time, but I never really understood what that meant until, you know, the past year or two. Um, but because of that, you know, I've, I've really been able to take my care of myself and take a step back and think about what, how do I want to enter the space instead of what are all the holes that I need to fill in. Yeah. So that's kind of what the, uh, the past three years have been like, you know, I, actually struggled a lot with, um, PTSD, not just from the shooting, but actually from activism, mm. um, in, you know, the threats in, uh, the harassment mm. in even the, how hard we were working at times, you know, like getting four hours of sleep, you know, oftentimes, you know, every day for a month or two is not, it's not healthy, especially mm. when you're a younger person, and you, need, yeah. you need a lot of sleep. Yeah. Um, and, and then you have to go in front of people and talk, and then you have to go on the, you know, the news and stuff. And you're concerned that you're, you know, are you taking up too much space? Do you want to uplift, you know, how do you uplift people properly, but not in a tokenistic banner, but how yeah. do you like still highlight the issues that's going on? Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, luckily because 
you know, going to therapy for basically the past year and a half, I've, mm-hmm. I've really been able to start focusing much more on taking care of myself and mm-hmm. consistently, you know, checking my bases every day of like, it seems ridiculous, but just eating, you know, drinking, getting enough sleep yeah. and, and focusing on those basic core things mm-hmm. until I can really start to build a, you know, a, on top of that foundation to become more productive, but in a healthy, in a healthy manner. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of maturity there too, and growth along the way. And that, you know, not to oh, say yeah. that you weren't mature early on too, but just even the way that you kind of right. characterized, like you were going a thousand miles an hour at the beginning, then you're realizing where you need to pull back, where you need to have that self-care. But, you know, I imagine that's still not easy because in some ways I think that's what feeds a cycle because, you know, the less sleep, the more work you do, the more outcome and the more output you can right. see. So I'm curious, like, how right. did you move along that? Because in some ways it's almost like you had to sacrifice some of the work to be able to take care of yourself. And you talked about having that long-term trajectory. I imagine right. that's still a tension because it's like, well, I'm not doing this work. I'm pulling back. So X, Y, and Z is not getting done. So how, how have you yeah. reconciled that in your mind? I think the main way I've reconciled it is realizing that I, you know, I think because we have a very individualistic culture, we have a tendency to get very self-absorbed in the work that we do and think that mm-hmm. we're the only person doing the work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that applies to all of us, honestly, because, you know, we're all the stars of our own reality TV shows mm-hmm. in some sense, you know, in our mind. Um, I think what it took me realizing was it it was truly effectively delegating and working to hire people, you know, that were actually qualified to do this work, had experience doing this work in the nonprofit space, um, and organizing stuff to help do the work, uh, within March for our lives or the, you know, the organization has basically grown, you know, uh, over like basically eight times, you know, over the past, uh, two years in terms of like our total number of staff, cause we were woefully understaffed and had a severe lack of experience, honestly, with a lot of the work that we were doing. Um, and it's still youth led, but we have people that have more experience, you know, helping execute the plans that young people ultimately come up with in the first place. Um, so that's been the the most effective thing is like Mm. hiring other people to do the work that I didn't necessarily need to be doing myself, but I just found myself doing a lot of the time. Um, and then just preoccupying myself with school, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, cause it's, as you can imagine, going, going to college and, uh, traveling every weekend and going on, like, it's just, you know, I kind of had to realize that there's some sacrifices involved in Mm -hmm. order for me to prioritize really what's best for my future. And that's going to college instead of just, you know, um, necessarily doing a ton of work every day in this, in this field that in some ways is also just exhausting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, um, activism a lot of the time is a, it's a really thankless job. Um, and it's, uh, it's difficult because you can, you can believe that even if you do achieve these things that somehow it's going to like make up for that lack of self-care, but it doesn't, it Mm -hmm. really doesn't. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been difficult making those decisions, but you kind of have to learn how to say no a lot of the time, even though it's hard. Um, and it feels like you're, you know, it almost feels like, cause we're told so often about how important it is to take every opportunity. Mm-hmm. It kind of feels like you're cutting off your right arm for lack mm-hmm. of a better word. Yeah. Um, but you have to realize that, you know, even if it does feel that way, ultimately you have to be able to, you know, survive and focus on what's really important. And in my case, that's school. Yeah. Um, and it's also the work that, uh, March for our lives does that doesn't get on the news focusing mm-hmm. on mutual aid focusing on you know the different aspects of racial and economic um, justice that plays mm-hmm. into ending gun violence and mm-hmm. and stopping people from wanting to pick up a gun in the first place instead of just talking about how they get the gun yeah you know it's a it's a we have to have a holistic solution here that we talk about and those conversations unfortunately aren't things that are great to fit in sound bites or great to put on the news um for a lot of people because they they don't want to talk about the lack of resources yeah. that causes a community to you know, uh, that results in violence, mm-hmm. um, and historic and systemic injustice. Uh, but that's the work that we're doing and it's, uh, it hasn't been an easy transition, but I've just mm-hmm. realized, you know, I have to, I have to take care of myself and focus on what's ahead with school and, yeah. uh, yeah, been working on a couple of cool projects at school too. I worked on our, our, there's a public opinion polling project that I worked on this semester for youth. Oh, nice. So yeah, it was cool. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways it sounds like you're just, you're letting yourself ride that tension too. Because there's, right. I mean, because there's so much work that, that has to be done. You know, I mean, even as I'm right. listening to you talking, I'm sure you know, this probably hits you too. Like, I mean, that's a Herculean amount of work that you're talking about. And that's not something that anyone would be, would be able to do if they're spread too thin. But at the same time, right. like it's certainly no one can do themselves. Yeah. 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 
I mean, would you say that you all have, as a group, have people bought into this idea of self-care or has it been certain pockets of people? Like, like how's that? I'm just thinking about, you know, I'm imagining what the vibe was like when you all started and how much energy there must've been as you all were touring mm-hmm. across the country. But I'm curious if that, this shift has kind of pervaded yeah. martial lives or do you think it's in pockets? I think it's in pockets. I, th- okay. I think it's more like, I think a lot of the time, especially the young people that were involved in the beginning, myself included, but especially for some of the other people that weren't as privileged as me to have like the power of being like, not only like being a guy, but also being like a white straight guy mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. first place. Like inherently it's going to be a lot easier for me to exist in these spaces than a lot of, you know, other co-founders that mm-hmm. were women or non-binary or were, you know, LGBTQ, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and for a lot of them, they, they understandably just got exhausted and mm-hmm. weren't accepting of a space that, you know, um, wasn't, you know, which is really difficult for them to function in because, you know, young people aren't born with HR experience, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, in a youth-led organization, I'll say the uh, the the reason why March, March for Our Lives has been successful is because it is youth-led, mm-hmm. but it's also that very same youth-led energy that can also end the organization mm-hmm. because it's, you know, it's the combination of a lot of energy and kind of ad hocracy mm-hmm. with paired with a a lack of experience, to be honest, uh, can be really, really damaging. So a lot of, a lot of the co-founders have, you know, um, taken a step back, which I think mm-hmm. is fine. You know, mm-hmm. I think we see that throughout these movements. There's, there are people that take years off at times yeah. and step back in. And, you know, honestly, even if some of the co-founders don't ever want to do this work again, they've done more than 99.9% yeah. of people will ever do in their lives around this issue. So I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm forever thankful for that. And I can't, mm-hmm. I can't blame them because mm-hmm. ultimately, you know, I want them alive. Um, that's what it comes down to because this work is really it's really hard, um, for these, uh, young people. So I think a lot of them were either for like myself, were forced to learn about Mm self-care, um, by to use a metaphor, kind of like, you know, you can tell someone to not put their, their hand on a hot stove, um, a lot of times, but sometimes it takes getting burned to really realize the importance of not doing that. And I think that may be the case. No, mm-hmm. I, I don't mean to generalize, but I, I right, think it right. is the case with a lot of young people, mm-hmm. especially traumatized young people that mm-hmm. care so much, understandably about this issue. Um, but yeah, so a lot of the co-founders have taken a step back to focus on the arts, focus on uh, theater, focus on mm-hmm. college, which is totally valid. And I'm never going to, I'm never going to you know blame them for that. But I think uh, as an organization, we've gotten a lot better at focusing on that self-care aspect. Mm-hmm. We do a lot more workshops and, mm-hmm. you know, trainings around it and stuff now. Um, but unfortunately when it is young people, there is some element of needing to learn it the hard way, at least in my case, because I, I can't tell you how many times I was told to, you know, make sure you're taking care of yourself. And I, I didn't understand. Yeah. I always heard that, but I didn't understand what that looked like for me until I really sat down and started to kind of get reconnected with my, my emotions and Mm -hmm. my experiences and stuff. Because I think, especially with guys, uh, I, I know that I had a tendency in the beginning to just shut out all the emotions and, mm. and trauma, yeah. the secondhand trauma that I was, you know, hearing about every day of people, you know, having their loved ones shot, having their, pe- even their pets shot in front of them, you know, just yeah. horrible stuff. Yeah. Um, and just like, kind of like blocking it out was, I thought was the best way of dealing with it, but it actually just mm-hmm. piles up, you know? And I actually found myself, I thought, I thought the, uh, PTSD and the, the trauma and stuff from activism, from mm-hmm. uh, obviously the shooting and stuff was, which is something that would make me sad. And that's how I would know. But I, what I didn't realize is it, it just made me numb. I didn't feel anything for mm-hmm. the longest mm-hmm. time, um, which was really concerning. You know, it mm-hmm. got to the point where like I, every conversation I had was about gun violence. Mm-hmm. And I, wow. cause I, I was talking so little to any of my friends about anything else. Cause the mm-hmm. work just became our life. Yeah. Um, and what it took for me was really sitting down and journaling every day to get back in touch mm-hmm. with my emotions and mm-hmm. like, what I, to process what I'd gone through in the past year, going to therapy and stuff, Mm -hmm. um, to understand that those emotions are, you know, are are things that I have to cope with as anyone else does. And it's not just something that you can just block out. So that's been a lot of my journey around the, uh, the self-care aspect and Mm -hmm. the co-founders as well and, and other students, but you know, I'd be lying if I said it was, uh, if I said it was easy and there weren't people that, you know, um, did, you know, are hurt, not, Mm -hmm. not necessarily by any fault of their own, but just by, you know, we're, we're trying to do the work of a government here essentially Mm -hmm. because our government is not doing this work and that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have elected, you know, we're supposed to be college students or high school students. Mm -hmm. We have elected officials that are supposed to represent us for a reason. And it's Mm -hmm. exactly so we shouldn't have to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, that's, that's so that's so important. I mean, you, I mean, you've hit on so many important pieces there too. But I mean, I think again, just the it seems like you've really gotten to a good place of just realizing a lot of these things. I mean, kind of the self reflection, even as you're talking about the journaling that you're all doing more work than you should be doing, and just all the weight that comes with that. Because even as you were talking about, you know, all the families that you've interacted with across the country, like immediately my mind was going to like, I mean, all those conversations are weighty, and in some ways. I feel like you must have, even if you didn't know, been carrying all that on you too. Cause those like oh, yeah. those stories you hear them over and over again, they're going to penetrate at some point. But, I mean, it seems yeah. like in a lot of ways you're able to kind of channel that energy into the increased activism. But then still you have your own mm-hmm. story. You have all these stories that you're carrying with you. And so really having a place to process that, I think is really important. It sounds yeah. like that's been kind of a, a weekly daily process for you as of late, just making sure that you have the space for that, which I think is is critical, but not always easy to, um, acknowledge in the in the the heat of the moment in the sense when you're in the middle of the work so yeah yeah i i mean i think it goes it's also uh it's so important to deal with that self-care aspect because i i've seen so many times how in activism because it is it it, it i would be lying you know if i mm-hmm. said it wasn't traumatizing work for a lot mm-hmm. of young people including mm-hmm. myself like you know getting called by people with ar-15s yeah. getting screened up by them having your house swatted you know death threats that i get but also a lot of kids that work in the organization and in the gun violence prevention movement and people too, in general, get, um, you know, that trauma and that exhaustion can end up turning us on each other Mm. because we start to think the reason why we're not being successful is because of people that we're working with Mm. when in reality, it's because this, you know, no, you know, you can say activism isn't easy or social change isn't easy, but it is really, really hard. And it may not because of it's, it may not necessarily be because of anybody's fault that you work Mm. with. Mm-hmm. But you can start to turn on each other when you're not taking yeah. care of yourselves, yeah. which I think is a major problem that not just, you know, uh, the the peace advocacy space mm-hmm. has, mm-hmm. but also uh, a problem that social movements have in general, because the work that we do really is incredibly yeah. important. Yeah. Um, but when we're not taking care of ourselves, we can have a tendency to turn on each other and get mm-hmm. really negative mm-hmm. and act horribly towards each other. And if you don't select times, you know, on a regular basis to really sit down and talk those things out, it piles up and it really starts hurting people. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important. You all are paying attention to that. So I mean, even, you know, all the things that you all have been through, I mean, just in general, and people have gone through that, as you know, I mean, it has an effect, it has an effect on people's day-to-day lives just in terms of like, you know, schoolwork in general, can they still focus as well? Then you add on all the activism work that you're doing, which has a whole nother heightened level of importance and tension and, and just, weight right. to it and you put all that together so i think yeah that's so important mm-hmm. that's been at the forefront f- forefront recently yeah. in a lot of ways um you know i was okay. thinking back to one of the interviews you and your sister did too when you know one, one of the things you talked about reminded me of that just when you all were talking about how the activism was your therapy in a sense um and it seems like what you've been talking about is ways that you're able to kind of channel that and use that as a way to cope do you think that was um effective and helpful in some ways i mean you've kind of talked about the ways where some things were ignored but and now you didn't pay as much attention necessarily to some of the self cares you right. maybe could have, but what, what, what would you say are some of the positives of, of what you're doing and the activism and how that affected you all as people? I mean, I actually think sometimes that like massive marches and demonstrations, even if not, you know, um, directly politically impactful or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I think it can actually be really beneficial in some ways because people realize they're not alone. And I think mm-hmm. that's been one of the biggest benefits mm-hmm. that we've seen a lot of social movements um, from, you know, feminist movements, historically speaking, to civil rights, um, to, to peace, to anti-war movements is mm-hmm. in some ways they're almost like massive, you know, it, it's certainly not like, you know, certified as group therapy, but in some ways it's, yeah. it's kind of like a massive venting session that yeah. I think actually can be really helpful for people. I think the issue comes when those individuals continue to focus so much on that and sacrifice stuff to try to end the things that are causing this trauma mm. that they end up throwing away the things that they love and mm. the people that they love, not, mm. not throwing them away, throwing them away is too hard of a word, but not prioritizing them right. just as much yeah. as the work, you know? Um, and that ends up making them feel really resentful, you know, towards the movement, towards the people that they work with mm. because they feel like they've sacrificed so much and there's been so little progress, mm. which, you know, honestly, um, there's been a lot of progress in terms of the historical perspective in, in gun violence prevention, but um, on the scale that we need it at, it's been very little, unfortunately. Right. Right. Um, but I, I think it actually, the activism in some ways done properly can be a form of therapy, mm-hmm. but done 
done in a way that causes harm or done in a way that where you're not taking care of yourself can be a, a you know, a, a form of trauma. Mm. Um, when you're throwing away the things that you love and just working on it every single day and you have, you know, there's no end in sight of when it's going to stop. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so yeah, that, that, that would be my main, yeah, my main way of thinking about it. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. I mean, the, the, the group therapy therapy piece in particular, I mean, I think there's a, it's a lot to that. Cause there's that, you know, yeah. common lived experience that you all had to, right. that you can support each other in and talking and, to someone who understands, the, who understands it. Yeah. The, and there's a lot of power in that, you know, mm -hmm. because we feel like we're surrounded you know, when you're around 800,000 people, even if not all of them have been affected by gun violence, a lot of them have been, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like at the March, for example, um, those people see each other and they mm -hmm. see that they're not alone. And mm -hmm. I actually think that's a huge amount of value in that, especially with like the power of the NRA mm -hmm. and the, the people that choose to try to advocate for the rights of inanimate objects over human beings. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they're so loud. And they have such, you know, strong connection to each other that mm. the people that are actually affected mostly by those, by those actions that want people and kids to be protected, not weapons like an AR-15 can feel alone, mm. even though we're mm. actually in the majority, if you do a poll, you know, the, mm. the country in general. Um, and that's, that solidarity and friendship piece mm. and community piece is extremely powerful because it's that community that enables social movements, I believe in the long term, mm. to succeed because mm. at the core at the core of social movement power and the core of political power isn't politics at all. It's culture, it's mm -hmm. music, it's mm -hmm. storytelling. Mm -hmm. And it's only in those community spaces when we're around each other that we're able to like, you know, show love and appreciation for each other and care for each other, mm -hmm. even as unfortunately no actions taken or even, you know, retroactive actions taken. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to be there uh, kind of is the, the the bedrock and endurance that mm -hmm. is necessary for the sustainability of the movement. But when that when that community is only working solely on the issue itself and not really hanging out yeah. um, and talking with each other, it's that's when things you know come in. And that's actually one thing I realized in some research mm -hmm. that I did this semester that wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily very scientific, but it was just for a, a history class of mine. You know, I was interviewing uh, a different civil rights activists that uh, went to Harvard and worked on like the Freedom okay. Rides, nice. for example, oh. and uh, one of them talked about how, uh, I won't say his name for, for, for privacy reasons, but yeah. one of them, um, talked about how, when he, it was like, I think it was like 1963 or something like that. He went down to, uh, the South to work on the freedom rides. And he, he was meeting up with like some young people from the student nonviolent coordinating committee and everything. And he walked in the room as a sophomore at, at Harvard, I think. And, uh, he, he was expecting a ton of students to be strategizing on a chalkboard and like drawing all this stuff out, talking about policy and everything. But he walked in and, you know, the, these young civil rights activists, you know, from all around the South were actually having a preach off seeing who could imitate MLK the best, you know, and dancing yeah. wow. and playing guitar and, and, and singing together. And one thing he told me is like, you know, how, how could you see that and not want to be part of that? Mm -hmm. Right. I mm -hmm. think it's that community aspect, hanging out with each other, that music, Mm -hmm. that really builds successful social movements in the long run, mm -hmm. because ultimately, you know, leaders in social movements can have their own impacts in, in, in different ways, but the real power in those isn't just, it, it's in the culture and it's in the community mm -hmm. because, um, you know, it's, uh, the best movements are ones where everyone are leaders in the yeah. first place, you know, where everybody's able to lead themselves and take care of each other. And it's when we're not doing that, when we're not having fun, it's not sustainable. So that's yeah. been a big focus of myself and it, um, the organization over the past year is figuring out how can it's difficult with COVID, but how can we celebrate our wins? How can we, yeah. you know, take time to hang out and do things not related to incredibly exhausting and traumatized work, like trying yeah. to stop people from getting shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so important. I mean, the research backs us up too, you know, in terms of the psychology research that's been done, looking at the power of community, even in terms of the neuroscience research, looking at what being a community does to the brain and how it helps with just moving right. through stressors and resilience. So I think, I mean, Right. Everything you're saying is spot on in a lot of ways. How would you how would you say you're cultivating that? Because it seems like there's two pieces there. There's both kind of the self-care, the daily self-care, but then also making sure there's the community self-care right. and making sure that those are are ingrained in a way. Yeah. So I think I think one thing that we are trying to do kind of is trying to develop some kind of system to deal with the 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 um inevitable grievances that come up between yeah. organizers and mm -hmm. leaders. Um on a, on a, you know, an annual basis where we just talk it out, you know, we, we talk that shit out 
and yep. <laughs> move on, you know? Um, uh, but it's also what, the way that I practice it personally is mm-hmm. um, I, I just call up friends randomly that I've worked with, um, which, you know, some people don't like being called or whatever, but you know, I'll text them or I, I just like talking to them and stuff. And, and mm-hmm. I ask them, you know, I, I basically at, at some points, you know, I, I check in with them and I just talk to them casually, but really, you know, it's to, it's a good way of checking myself to make sure I'm taking yeah. care of myself, but it's yeah. also, it's a good way of having accountability for making sure other people are taking care of themselves as well. Mm-hmm. Cause I think if we look at the history of the civil rights movement, unfortunately, because of understandably the incredible amount of trauma and stuff behind it, there's a lot of people, um, we hear a lot about like the successes of the leaders and stuff and different everyday people that mm-hmm. participated. What we don't hear a lot about is, you know, the people that, you know, ended up, um, abusing various like substances and stuff because of the trauma mm-hmm. and not being able to do with it and stuff. And, you know, um, I don't know how much of that you can, when it's that level of trauma, I don't know how much of that you can actually just deal with through community. Um, but I think that's something that we're trying to develop in the organization, mm-hmm. but just personally, you know, I, I just call friends randomly a lot of the yeah. time and check in with them and I'm like, Hey, so what are you doing to take care of yourself? You know, mm-hmm. what are you doing that you love, um, that you enjoy? Mm-hmm. And, you know, how are you making sure that you're not underwater basically and taking on mm-hmm. too much stuff because we need you to be here. We need people to be here for decades to come yeah. possibly. Yeah. And, uh, not just the next two years, but the next 20 mm-hmm. or even longer, uh, hopefully not, but you know, we, we need to be prepared for yeah. that. So I found that that's a good way of checking in with people because there, I think there's a, a bad tendency that I, I still have, but not nearly as bad as I used to. And I, I know a lot of other people have had in the organization in the past where we'd only talk to each other in, in moments of crisis or when we mm. needed to like mobilize. Mm. And when you have that, I think there comes to be an association with each other of really negative feelings mm-hmm. and grievances. Yeah. Um, if you're only mobilizing after, you know, say another shooting happens or something mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. it's not healthy. Yeah. And by focusing on talking to each other in uh, non-crisis times, it's a good way of realizing that we're on the same side here. Mm -hmm. Right. And it helps reduce those like interpersonal conflicts and make sure that we're taking care of ourselves, which further helps to reduce those interpersonal conflicts. Yeah. Um, And it's just a good way of forming relationships because ultimately, you know, at at that core political powers I talked about in the past too, I think it's, I think it's culture, but it's also that community and the fabric, like the, the strings that make up that community and weaves it together are relationships Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're not relationships that are just made because you're only talking about work. Right. They're made because you understand what's going on with each other. You know, what's going on with each other's families, what's going on with each other's, you know, sig- yeah. significant others or whatever. Yeah. Um, and going on personally and you're there to support them, even if it's not work related, because the yeah. best, I, I think those are the best type of, uh, uh, activist, you know, community relationships are the ones where they're not at their core. They're not just around, okay, we need to do X thing. Right. It's around actually knowing what's going on with each other and understanding each, why we do this work and each other's motives and, and the challenges that each of us uniquely face. Yeah, that's so true. Cause then you have that foundation too. Like you said, that's not <laughs> just focused on the mobilizing or the trauma that's kind of built throughout that. And I think again, the research would back, would back that up too. There's so many, important, yeah. so many important pieces there. I'm, I'm curious yeah. if you feel like there's enough resources in place too. Cause I mean, one of the, you know, I don't do trauma work specifically, but I know one of the things that comes up quite a bit is making sure that people really know how to help other people walk through that. Cause you get a lot of instances where people don't know how to handle that. So they have good intentions, mm-hmm. but they're actually just end up re-traumatizing people. I mean, you may, right. you may, we, you know, we talked about that before I got, it just even in terms of somehow, somehow some of the interviews that you've done and how it kind of gets back to that same thing over and over again. So I wonder mm-hmm. if you all have even thought about that in terms of the movement, like, do you feel like there are more resources? And obviously that's a challenge if resources are thin, but are there more resources that should be in place to help people actually process that trauma as they're engaged in the work so that it's not, you know, going into a place that's just making it that much more difficult, even with good intentions, but unintentionally. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that we certainly have more resources than we did in the past, mm-hmm. but it's not nearly enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm just talking about the movement as a whole, but mm-hmm. I mean, which includes March for our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the difficulties is that, um, we're so focused on spending the money, like on the work mm-hmm. that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it, it can seem hard for us to justify like, mm-hmm. you know, if we need to pay for a therapist, you know, or like some kind of like community counselor or something. Mm-hmm. Um, even though in my opinion, like resources are severely lacking, but honestly, the the biggest obstacle besides the NRA 
to us actually being successful, I would say is our trauma mm-hmm. and the divisions that it creates. Mm-hmm. And yep. it's hard to justify. It can be hard to justify to, a fun, you know, to donors or people that just give a small amount or whatever, um, you know, spending, spending a couple, a couple thousand dollars, for example, and like helping reduce like community trauma mm-hmm. and like all these things that sound very vague, but really are important. Yeah, they are. Um, and, and managing better relationships and how to do those trainings instead of spending that money on registering, you know, a couple hundred new voters or a couple thousand mm-hmm. new voters or whatever. Right. Even though the only reason why we, the, the overall return on investment, if you know, if, yeah. if that's really what we're talking about here is significantly more, mm-hmm. if we're able to do more work and get more volunteers and develop a stronger community, mm-hmm. if we're able to deal successfully with that trauma. Um, but I would say, you know, that's one of the difficult things is, uh, honestly, if I could, I, I would, um, uh, if we had the money to do it and people were more accepting of like understanding the importance of that, yeah. um, I, I would love to hire way more, you know, HR people and like, um, not just HR, but like, uh, I, I don't know what term to come up with. That doesn't sound incredibly vague and like BS, but like, I guess like people that really help manage community wellness mm-hmm. and like yeah. developing proper protocols between like how to train people, like, especially in the past year, you know, since George Floyd and everything, like mm-hmm. talking, you know, it's difficult when there's kids from all different communities of all different races that oftentimes, you know, have never really worked together in a social mm-hmm. justice manner. They might've gone to school together and stuff, but like, um, you know, the dynamics of racial identity and trauma mm-hmm. in the United States and talking about it is, uh, something that a lot of, to be completely honest, you know, just white kids do not understand mm-hmm. at all. You know, yeah. I, I, something that I'm still learning about if I'm being completely honest and mm-hmm. trying to, I'm always trying to get better at it, but it's, uh, it's not something we're born knowing, especially, right. and we certainly don't learn it from society or the media. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't think we have necessarily at all enough resources to deal with that trauma, unfortunately, mm-hmm. cause it's hard to justify. Yeah. Um, but it's needed, you know, yeah. and we have done some things around it. You know, we try to do, we try to have like occasion, you know, somewhat, you know, uh, we try to give people time off, have retreats. And we try to be really affirming of when people need to, you know, go on vacation and really celebrate that because like this work is hard. It's really hard. And our issue is not that people don't want to do the work. It's that they want to do too much work. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, in a lot of ways, I mean, you're talking about a cultural shift too, because if some of those, those resources are needed and I agree with you, that makes things better in the long run, but it doesn't look as shiny if you're trying to, right. you know, if you're trying to raise money, it doesn't, right. like, I mean, if we, it doesn't look like a, as much of an investment because you can't see that outcome right away, but and it doesn't get like on the saying, you can see what happens yeah. when it's not addressed, but right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, it's not, unfortunately the, the work, a lot of the work that needs to be done in the organization and in, in the social justice space is not, mm-hmm. you know, to end gun violence or, you know, uh, address the things that play into gun violence, like racial justice or environmental injustice or, economic injustice are not things that necessarily get on the news super easily. Um, for example, March this year committed to a, uh, we have a half million dollar commitment to like grants and focus on mutual Mm -hmm. aid, you know, providing Mm -hmm. food, clothing, whatever, whatever communities need and going specifically to the community, the black and brown communities that are most impacted by gun violence and asking, you know, asking them how we can be supportive to the, Mm -hmm. you know, of the community organizations like life camp, I'm wearing the shirt of right now. Um, so doing funny. the work on the mm-hmm. ground, stopping kids from shooting each other, you know, mm-hmm. or, or everyday people from shooting each other. Mm-hmm. Instead of going to them and saying, this is what we're going to do for you. We're going to throw, you know, $10,000 at you and you're just going to be happy. And like, we did our job, we're equitable or whatever. We're, we're going to really ask because we understand we don't, I don't know what goes on in, for example, Jamaica Queens, where mm-hmm. this, this shirt of life camp that I've worked with, I don't mm-hmm. know what goes on there. You know, mm-hmm. Erica Ford, who's been doing this work for 20 years in Jamaica Queens and is stopping kids from shooting each other every day. Mm-hmm. Um, she knows what needs to be done. Right. So mm-hmm. we ask people like her, what can we do to be supportive? But, um, even though there's that big commitment, which is a significant part of our budget, we're not like the NRA. We don't have a hundred million dollar budget or mm-hmm. whatever a year yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we, we get by, but it's, it's still nothing in comparison to that. Even though there's that commitment and the work that comes out of it, um, it doesn't get on the news, mm-hmm. you know? So it's hard because like, we know that that's the work that needs to be done to mm-hmm. actually be to to help advance the movement forward. Mm-hmm. But it's also difficult because we know that a lot of that money, in comparison to spending it on something like, um, you know, a big event or something, it's not going to get on the news. But yeah. we know that that's the work that needs to be done. Exactly. 
I think that's actually a really big problem with the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm-hmm. If you know, if I'm being completely honest, is that we have a system of incentives that incentivize people to do things that get on the news, even mm-hmm. if they're not necessarily effective, mm-hmm. right? Um, I I can't tell you the number of times I've seen organizations spend six, even seven figures on things that could have been massively impactful mm-hmm. for extremely under resourced community organizations, mm-hmm. um, and had a huge impact, but they choose instead to spend on something that's going to get on CNN or, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, even though it's not going to have that much of an impact, you know, in comparison to where that money actually really could go. So right. it's, um, you know, it's difficult because when we get questions of like, oh, what is March for Our Lives doing? It's like, well, we're focusing on these mutual aid programs. We're focusing on talking about what we call armed supremacy, right? Mm-hmm. Like the role of guns in white supremacist mm-hmm. like circles yeah. and actions in the enforcement of white supremacy in the United States. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking about mental health, but not in a way that's like, not not in a way where it's like, let's talk about the mental health of the shooter at my high school and why he decided to do that and talk about that only because he's a white kid, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, you know, we tend to stereotype white mass shooters as mentally ill because mm-hmm. we don't want to talk about the fact that they're a lot of the time, not always, but mm-hmm. a significant amount of the time, it's simply, or, or not, I can't say simply, but uh, it, it's in large part, if not entirely, because they're a racist asshole. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the shooter at my high school was racist and anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. He was known to have drawn things like swastikas on stuff and you know, um, I, I don't see that men, that racism mm-hmm. and anti-Semitism as a, a mental illness. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's difficult because we want to talk about mental health in regards to the two thirds of gun deaths that are suicides mm-hmm. and don't get on the news. Right, right. Right. That's really what needs to be addressed. If we want to talk about addressing total gun deaths, mm-hmm. we should be talking two thirds of the time, if not more, about gun suicide. Mm-hmm. But because the mental health conversation is only around who a mass shooter is. Mm-hmm. I cannot tell you, I, I've had conversations before with kids that said like they they were depressed. So they went through the school counselor and their school counselor put them on a list saying that they were a possible mass shooter because they were depressed and they were worried about hurting themselves, wow. right? That is the effect that the media is having mm. on these conversations. Yeah. And it's so hard because, you know, we can't, those conversations around armed supremacy, around mm-hmm. mental health, but around suicide prevention. And around you know mutual aid and racial justice mm-hmm. are not easy things to fit in a soundbite like exactly. gu- you know universal background checks which yeah. yes can have an impact but ultimately you know isn't it, for a lot of cities that have stronger gun laws although there's certainly a lack of federal ones a lot of these guns that that get there quite frankly you know um, get there illegally because mm-hmm. there's inter- there's a lack of like federal guidance around interstate gun trafficking mm-hmm. that could actually prevent it you know if you if you can't if it's extremely hard to get a gun in Chicago or, you know, it's not necessarily as hard as it could be, but it's still hard nonetheless. You can just drive 30 minutes to Indiana and get a gun and come back. Or some guy can go and buy 50 guns and sell them out of the back of his truck legally a lot of the time, you know, on the south or west side and and, and have them go out that way. Mm-hmm. But what we need to address is, you know, why are these people, why do people on the south and west side feel the need to pick up a gun in the first place? It's because mm-hmm. they don't have resources. You know, Parkland has significantly weaker gun laws than Chicago or mm. any mo- than many other cities in the country. We don't have shootings on a daily basis, mm. and it's not because it's not because we don't it's not because we we have the most police officer mm-hmm. or the most you know sh- stringent gun laws. It's because we have the most resources, mm-hmm. and having those conversations are not that those nuances are e- yeah. extremely hard to get across right. in a TV news yeah. interview. Right? It's yeah. it doesn't fit into the neatly packaged trauma industrial media Mm -hmm. complex that Mm -hmm. commodifies these mass shootings where they have graphics like it's a like it's some kind of baseball game or something where it's like this is how many people were you know die this is how it compares to other mass shootings and things like that without any regard to the fact that most people that are going to die today from gun violence are self-inflicted gunshot wounds Mm -hmm. they are unintentional shootings Mm -hmm. and their everyday acts of you know gun violence of interpersonal gun violence and domestic violence Mm -hmm. right that's what needs to get on the news, but doesn't. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's difficult well, because our, what we need to do is over here, you know, uh, it, it, it's in one corner and we know what we need to do, but what actually enables people to get a good, like the nonprofit industrial complex to get a return on investment so they can continue doing the work might be in a completely different space. Yeah. And there's plenty of people that do that. And then we get people asking, well, what are we doing? Yeah. And the, the answer is we're doing more work than we ever have. Yeah. And we're in a, the best place the organization, in my opinion, has ever been in terms mm. of sustainability. Hmm. But we're focusing on things that the news doesn't typically like to cover. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you're doing the real work, but it's not getting out there. And like you said, I mean, with right. the sound bites, so much of the truth gets lost, too. I mean, especially around the mental health conversations. I mean, all the evidence right. shows that those struggling with mental health are much more likely to be victims. 
of gun violence right. and perpetrators. Exactly. Somehow that continues to get lost in the conversation. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and yeah. yeah. Good. Those issues around funding are why we need more people to yeah. to contribute. You know, like we'll we'll tell you about the work that we do. It's just yeah. you're not going to see it on CNN, even though it's way more important than the work that does get on CNN. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, on that lines, like, what do you see as your role? Because I mean, there's that again, there's that tension, which I think is just a theme of a lot right. of the work that you're doing because it's so. One, it's such important work and it's such a huge problem that that tension is going to be there right. in a lot of ways. But how, how do you balance between what you're doing on the ground that you know is making an effect and making a difference versus what's getting the airtime in a sense? Not that the airtime is important, but right. in some ways the airtime could help galvanize right. the work that's being done. So I, I mean, know if you all have those conversations, if you're trying to you know, wrestle with that. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I think what we try to do is we try to, we're trying to make the organization more, more fa- uh, faithful Mm -hmm. instead of faceless, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're trying to show the other leaders in the organization that may not be from Parkland, but nonetheless, I would consider almost like co-founders of different Mm -hmm. marches, you know, around Mm -hmm. the country. Yeah. Um, One of them is like a a board member of mine, a fellow board youth board member of mine who just graduated college and is now a Truman Scholar and endowed a movement. He's done a a ton of work in gun Mm -hmm. prevention in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we we try to get him on the news, but it's difficult when news wants wants to tell very... They want to put us in a box of like mm-hmm. mainly white Parkland students and just that's it. Mm-hmm. When in reality, we realize in order to make this movement, mm-hmm. you know, our contribution to the movement, because we're by no means the movement, mm-hmm. but make our contribution to the movement successful and as impactful as it can be, that it, it, it has to go beyond the wall, you know, the border of Parkland. Mm-hmm. It has to be all encompassing of the United States. Yeah. And it's difficult because it's harder to tell a story that way because there's so many different communities, mm-hmm. right? And you're trying, there's so many different solutions that that have to be talked about, but we realize that that's really the only way that can be done. The other thing that I do is uh, when I'm doing interviews is, um, you know, for example, yesterday I was on uh, MSNBC Mm -hmm. and they're like, you know, how are you David? And all that stuff. And like, I care about that answer is I'm not great. Honestly, I don't think anyone that's gone through an instance of gun violence is ever really great Mm -hmm. um, ever again. Um, But what I, you know, what I always try to do is I try to redirect it towards Mm -hmm. people like Erica that have been, you know, in Jamaica, Queens, that have been doing this work for over, basically over 20 years at this point and are having a massive impact. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's talking about people like Pastor Mike that work with groups like Live Free and Faith in Action out in Oakland, California, mm-hmm. um, that are doing the real work mm-hmm. on the ground with cities and violence and erupters um, to redirect the conversation towards them. And I also see, you know, because I'm able to get into a lot of these rooms because of, mm-hmm. you know, my, my profile or, you know, the fact that I'm a, I'm a white guy, mm-hmm. um, and these rooms, even though the majority of people that are affected by gun violence tend to be like, you know, black and Brown, mm-hmm. um, you know, I see my role as helping up open, open, not, I, I hate this idea of a table cause there shouldn't be a table to begin with, you know, mm-hmm. because that's like a whole power structure. Right. Mm-hmm. But what I see it as is trying to, trying to like st- kind of step back and put people in my place, you mm-hmm. know, or exp- I guess help expand the table in some way, or mm-hmm. I, I don't, I've lost track of the metaphor by this point, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to use my position to basically bring in people like Erica a lot of the time mm-hmm. into meetings and yell at these people, you know, about like not being inclusive, not, mm-hmm. you know, doing these things properly. And it works, you know, because mm-hmm. of meetings that I've had before with other organizations um, or other coalition groups um, that were almost not entirely white, but were, you know, almost entirely white. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if we're in New York City and we're having a giant meeting 30 stories up in some building, but I know Erica's in Jamaica, Queens doing this mm-hmm. work and she's not in that room and yeah. no one like Erica is in that room. That's a problem. Exactly. Right. So um, I see it as helping to, I don't know, I don't like the power of dynamic is like shine a light mm-hmm. on um, on other communities, but I'm I'm trying to expand the spotlight yeah. to include the community, the communities that have been doing this work for decades. Yeah that have to organize, not because they want to, because it's for their survival. It's mm-hmm. for their literal survival that they do. Activism is not optional mm-hmm. for many people. Mm-hmm. From the majority of real activists that are out there, it is not optional. They mm-hmm. have to do it for the community, their own survival or the community's survival. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I see my role as, is trying to you know, acknowledge the amount of power that I have in, mm-hmm. in this position, that quite frankly, much of which, you know, is because of the work that I've done, but mm-hmm. also a large amount of it is because I'm a white guy. Yeah. Um, and recognizing that the responsibility that that power carries yeah. to acknowledge that and expand it to, you know, in or not expand it, but just, you know, highlight the work that's been doing for and show respect to the people that have been doing the work for decades before yeah. me. 
yeah. and with that power also use it to challenge other parts of the, mm-hmm. the disproportionately white you know piece at you know the national gun violence prevention organizations to challenge them to mm-hmm. actually focus on things that aren't just around gun control although it's needed mm-hmm. but talk about violence intervention programs and because yeah. of things like that um you know erica ford and uh pastor mike and others mm-hmm. you know were uh, at the white house in the rose garden mm-hmm. and biden upped his commitment from mm-hmm. you know in our initial kind of peace plan that we came up with we, i think mm-hmm. we had like a we demanded like a, a billion dollars, you know, over several years or something mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. to uh, violence intervention programs. And because of the work that uh, the Community Justice Action Fund and Amber Goodwin and others had been mm-hmm. doing uh, around that and in that space, and because of, I, I believe, because of part of March for Our Lives challenging these other mm-hmm. organizations by mm-hmm. highlighting the work that these orgs have been doing for way before any of us were here, yeah. um, Biden upped his commitment to $5 billion a year wow, or not $5 great. billion a year. Um, over, to yeah. five billion dollars over like eight years yeah, to the these time. programs yeah. that aren't policing based but are public health based, mm-hmm. you know, and can actually help um, communities in the first place by providing trauma services and reducing retaliation and resources. Nice. Um, yeah, that's so neat. And that's why I see my role is mm-hmm. helping to challenge that dynamic. Um, I'm by no means perfect. I I still fuck up a lot. Um, yeah. But you, you know, I, I try to do the best that I can and acknowledge yeah. when I do fuck up and you know continue to work through it. So. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's great. I mean, it's a, a holistic approach in a lot of ways. Cause you, I mean, I, I hate, I keep using the word tension, but I feel like it's all there. Cause I mean, in some, you know, you know, you've done the work like that carries weight, but then you also know there's privilege, which you didn't. Yeah. There's a lot of it. But there's a lot. Of- yeah. So, I mean, you're bringing those together. You're still making sure the people who have been doing the work on the ground are acknowledged. And so I think that's, I mean, in a lot of ways, what you're talking about is walking alongside them. And I think that's important right. too. Um, you know, I, I really see it as like I'm here being the one to kind of save you from your whatever X, Y, and Z, no. but I'm learning from you. I'm going to walk through it with you. Right. I'm going to come alongside you. I'm going to bring you where and, I am. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's really the approach that I try to take. You know, when I, when I've worked with Erica in the past, for example, I, I just happened to be in New York for, you know, different meetings and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, I have a couple of days off or whatever. I'm going to spend it working with you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. so, you know, Erica, see me as an intern. You know, like you want water, I, I'm here to learn. I'm just here mm-hmm. to observe. You want water, I'll get you water. You want coffee, I'll get you coffee. Like mm-hmm. you you need literally use me in whatever way you want. I just mm-hmm. want to observe and learn yeah. from truly the best. So I don't even see it as walking alongside them. I see it as walking behind them mm-hmm. and, I, you know, and, and let, seeing them lead and, mm-hmm. and learning from, you know, the different paths that mm-hmm. they've taken okay. of, yeah. of how I can be supportive in that in the first place and uh, highlight the work that they're doing. Uh, for lack of a better word, all these words, you know, there's such a power dynamic and they're so loaded, you know, like uplift, you know, uh, show the, shine the spotlight because it like, it, it, there's such a, I don't, I don't like the power dynamic that's within that vernacular Mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not the power dynamic that like is productive to this conversation because it Mm -hmm. comes from like a white saviorist place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that vernacular, you know, is a, not only white saviorist place, but also a white supremacist Mm -hmm. place in the first place that implies a sense of entitlement Mm-hmm. And a belief that you know more about how to what to do for someone's community than uh, the people that actually live in that community know what to do, right? Um, so it's difficult to talk about. Mm-hmm. But um, honestly, I, I I just try to lead with humility and ask ask uh, you know how I can be supportive as much as possible while acknowledging that you know I do screw up yeah. uh, from time to time, you know. Uh, but trying to learn from those things and under and be forgiving with myself too, which is hard. Yeah. especially with the kind of culture that we have on Twitter and social media that is yeah. not forgetting yeah, not a lot of the time. All. Which uh, again, is completely unrealistic as you know, as I'm sure right. you know, and especially, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to the first part of the conversation with everything that you've gone through already and everything that you're doing. Perfection is always unrealistic, but when you put all those pieces together and you, I mean, we talked about this too, just about the trauma, it's just not even a healthy place to start. So I know we're still back right. to kind of this, there's a huge cultural shift that we need to have in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I think hopefully COVID has helped with that. Granted, COVID has not been a good thing by any stretch of the imagination. Right. But I think in some ways it's helped people realize how a lot more of us react under stress and uncertainty and knowing that, okay, there needs to be some room for forgiveness when things get stretched right. in. And when people are in the middle of work after trauma, you need to mm-hmm. have that grace and forgiveness to be able to move through things and say, okay, are things really getting addressed? Or are you putting these standards on people to go a thousand miles an hour and hit unrealistic goals? And then if they have any little falter, then you just come down hard when you're not even right. going through it yourself. 
So. Right. And I, I mean, my, my thing is too, that, you know, if, if the movement can't be, if we're too pure for ourselves, mm. how are we ever going to have other people join in? Mm. Right. When mm. like the way that we learn a lot of the time is these mistakes, yeah, unfortunately, exactly. exactly. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no accountability. There yeah. should be, yeah. but there needs to be, you know, a demand, not just for accountability, but true growth and mm. learning. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's the only way that these things become successful. I I think it actually plays into the um a a bigger thing around how, you know, although yes, our government has a much bigger role to play in uh in ending gun violence and passing these laws and helping Mm -hmm. fund these programs, there's also a cultural role that we need to have Mm -hmm. in a a reevaluation of why are we as a country so you know obsessed with machines made to kill people Mm -hmm. that that's what they are, right? Mm -hmm. Um, why do we romanticize violence mm-hmm. and, you know, stigmatize, mm-hmm. you know, so many other things that mm-hmm. are, are not like that? Um, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it goes into not just a, a cultural aspect because the way I see ending gun violence is it's like, I think about a third of it is like the gun laws. I think a third of it is like different things about how do we stop people from wanting guns in the first mm-hmm. place. But another third is the cultural aspect. Mm-hmm that we have to, we have to acknowledge the fact that although our government is corrupt in a number of, in, in many ways, ultimately our government is a product of not all of us because of rampant voter suppression, but many of us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it is a, a reflection of our values as a yep. society. Yeah. As a society, we need to either reaffirm or change some of what we truly reprioritize, mm. what we truly do value, mm. um, you know, in order to do that. And I, I think that that comes down to a whole conversation too around justice. Mm-hmm, and that mm-hmm. I truly believe that if we want to end gun, gun violence, we need to acknowledge that gun violence is a symptom of injustice. Mm. If we don't address that injustice, mm-hmm. if we can't make a, 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 a an unjust country, we'll never be a peaceful country, mm-hmm. a peaceful country yeah. ever. Yeah. And we have to talk about that, those resources and the systemic injustice that causes this gun violence in the first place. Even though it's not easy to fit into a yeah. soundbite, it yeah. really is the only way we're ever going to end this in the first yeah. place. Yeah, that's so well said. It's so important. And you're right. I mean, it's not easy. I think that's part of the challenge that you all are trying right. to deal with head on. So, but I mean, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear about the organization, you know, still thriving in a lot of ways, even outside of the public eye, in a sense, and right. some of the structures that have been put in place, especially around the delegation, especially around the self-care. Because again, I think that's important for the, the life or for the organization. Yeah. And like you all said, the life of the community. Um, and the life right. of the communities that are doing this work. I would imagine, you know, those you've mentioned in the news for 20 plus years those pieces have to be in place in some shape or form, right. the community piece and the, the self-care. Otherwise, you know, with everything that they're and we're all running into is just not, not going to be sustainable. So. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's a big focus of the organization too. Mm-hmm. Um, part of the reason why that, you know, the media is lacking and stuff is that if we're, we rely, as I said in the past previously too, that, you know, stuff that gets on CNN isn't necessarily what ends this, but it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're focused on, uh, on doing more and saying less because mm-hmm. ultimately like, you know, the time that we spend talking is time that we could be spending registering voters. Mm-hmm. It's time that we could be spending, you know, helping raise money for community organizations and building coalitions mm-hmm. instead of competing against other nonprofits and stuff, which I think is a horrible um, product of the hyper-capitalistic nonprofit industrial complex that has been developed around treating symptoms like mm-hmm. gun violence instead of addressing causes mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. gun violence in mm-hmm. the first place. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's all the more reason why we need people to to help fund us because you know yeah. we're not getting we we may not be getting on CNN but we're registering voters we're doing yeah. we're doing the real work yeah um and, and we've seen the product of that in the past yeah. couple of years yeah that's really encouraging to hear and I appreciate you know us you know taking us through the journey too even in terms of from the beginning where you are now um, one thing I do want to do before we wrap up though is just in terms of you know folks who might be listening who are saying, okay, you know, I want to know more about either what's going on in my community or how I can help with some of these more national um, initiatives. Like where, where would you direct people in terms of really making an impactful difference and not just going for the, uh, the shine factor or tokenism yeah. or anything else like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the best thing that you could probably do in general, where there's a lot of resources available, is just going to the March for our lives website. It's mm-hmm. just March for our lives, like March for our lives.com. Um, and there you can register to vote if you're not. Um, but you can also text our 954954 text code um, that can let you know about local events, elections, and things like that, um, that our chapters and, and coalitions are working on in your area. Um, and you can see a lot of the work that March is doing that may not necessarily be getting on CNN, but is you know 
um, even more important than the stuff that gets on the news. So yeah, that's, that's really what I would say. And, um, you know, just try to do as much as you can at minimum, try to make it voting. If you have the privilege, because unfortunately voting is not a right in this country, I would argue Mm. for many people that have been incarcerated. Um, Mm. but, uh, if you have that ability to vote, please do so at the minimum. And if you, if you're able to do more, you know, try to do more, get involved with, you know, um, local community organizations, just look, look up like gun violence prevention mm. organization or whatever in your city. Um, if you're in New York, life camps, a great one that I would suggest, um, they're in Jamaica, Queens. There's also uh, save our streets in Bronx in the Bronx. Um, there's live free and, uh, um, there's live free and faith in action in Oakland and in the San Francisco area. Um, there's, uh, in Los Angeles, I'm trying to think of what it's called. Um, I forget. There's a number of organizations. There's a lot of organizations that do this work in LA too, that you can look up. Um, but yeah, just, you know, try to figure out how to get involved. And even, mm-hmm. even if it's just in a small manner, yeah. just do it consistently, you know, even if it's just voting, try to vote in every election. Um, even if it's just, you know, trying to volunteer or help out in any way, um, or working on a campaign of a, of a candidate that you're, you know, really runs on gun violence prevention. We need more people to do that because Mm -hmm. we don't, we have the disadvantage of not having several hundred million dollars like the NRA does, but we have the advantage of having way more people that Mm -hmm. support us, Mm -hmm. you know, in general, but we need those people to be much more out there Mm -hmm. because the NRA is a extremely loud, but effective, Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're an extremely, they're small, but extremely loud and effective minority. Um, and if we could just figure out how to get a small percentage of our country mobilized around this issue, we'd easily end it mm. in 10 years mm. or, or less, way less. Mm. Yeah. Well, so. I appreciate you sharing all those resources and all that, that great advice. I mean, there's so many different opportunities for people to really jump in and do the work that needs to be done. And the work is already being do- done in a lot of ways. So right. yeah. well, I appreciate you coming awesome. on, coming on the Addy Hour and taking us through. I mean, we covered a lot of ground, so. Uh, a lot of important yeah. ground, but really appreciate kind of hearing the journey and what you have uh, going for and continue to wish you the best and this important work, especially the work that's not, you know, not getting airplay. I mean, I think that's where, right. where, where the real, you know, the real work is being done in a lot of ways, but hopefully, you know, with some of these pieces, things will continue to get going. Yeah. So glad you're yeah, taking okay. care of yourself too. I mean, as we've yeah. talked about Yeah. Well, that, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's been great.